Got Cecil P. DeMille's back there. That's <laughs> right. And Roland. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Magaziner. I'm introducing Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Dr. Magaziner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear. Your whole background. He is a board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation with a subspecialty in pain management. Uh, he's board certified through the American Academy of Pain Management and he's a board certified physical therapist and licensed in New Jersey, which is what he was first, which is an absolutely fabulous background for this specialty. His goal of treatment is to repair, regenerate, and eliminate injury or pain and its causes. A bit of an old-fashioned doctor with a cutting-edge approach to treatment, Dr. Magaziner believes his best diagnostic tool is his ears to listen to the patient's complaints and his hands to do a thorough examination and actually feel where the pain is coming from. He calls this the Sherlock Holmes approach. <laughs> By adding the latest diagnostic testing where necessary, he is able to make a pinpoint diagnosis of the problem. Dr. Magazin. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. It's a great honor to be here today to be able to talk about something that I just you know love to talk about. It's really my career. It's what I go home at night and, and read up on to learn new ways to help people and, and stay with the greatest and latest advances in medicine. And what we're going to talk about today um, is what's considered state of the art uh, for the future of medicine, which is bioregenerative therapies, how to repair things as opposed to just taking pills and getting cortisone shots and surgery and things like that. And we only have you know, less than an hour now, or as much time you want to devote to it, I'm, I'm having no problem in staying. But, um, you know, we could talk about so many things. And I'm going to leave time uh, at the end to be able to answer questions that might not be directly related to uh, the lecture here, but in general, in terms of pain management, interventional pain treatments. So, what am I? I was a physical therapist, still am, board certified. I uh, went back to med school and I am now an interventional pain physician and physiatrist, physical medicine rehab. So we're going to have our focus today on some of the newer regenerative treatments for arthritis. But uh, the treatments that, uh, that we do uh, in, in regeneration are not just for arthritis. You can use it for any type of musculoskeletal pain, from an injury to a ligament, an injury to a tendon or a muscle or a joint. All right, um, so it applies you know, to anything uh, orthopedic that you can repair. So that's me, we talked about that already. That's some of my staff. And I'm located in North Brunswick on Route 27. I've been in practice for 22 years in this area. Prior to that, I was a physical therapist for seven years, and then somewhere in there, I took 10 years off to go to medical school and everything. All right, so we're going to be talking mostly about degenerative arthritis. There's different types of arthritis. You have rheumatoid arthritis and, and lupus and, and other things like that. But we're going to be talking about the one where it's kind of the wear and tear arthritis. And it affects a lot of people, all right? A lot of people have arthritis. I'm sure some of the people in this room have arthritis. I'm going to move it farther away from my mouth. Do you think that will help? Better down here. Maybe one of these things. Try it without it. No. How about over here? Yeah, that's better. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, you come out Okay. So it affects uh, some 20 million people in the United States. Uh, we talked about um, how you get arthritis, and uh, I think part of it's genetic, and part of it's wear and tear. Uh, am I in your way? Yeah. Yes. Okay. How about now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll just stand up over here. Maybe I'll stand over here. That's good. How's that? Yeah. 
How's this? Okay. Is this okay? Okay. Um, uh, with aging, the water content of, of cartilage uh, uh, changes, and the protein makeup of cartilage degenerates, and eventually cartilage uh, begins to degenerate, and flaking uh, occurs, and uh, forms tiny cracks in the cartilage. And one of the things that we do in our treatment is try to repair some of those cracks in the cartilage, which we'll talk about later. A uh, normal joint is the picture on your left, all this technology here, and basically uh, this would be an abnormal joint when you start getting narrowing of the space, this would be a normal space, and here you have your joint fluid and all, and this, this person in, in this picture has a little some bone spurs coming off, depicting uh, what an abnormal arthritic joint would look like. In advanced arthritis, you get total loss of cartilage, the cushion between the bones and joints uh, can be lost, and over the years, uh, you get a lot of inflammation and swelling in the joint, and what we're finding out now is that uh, the metabolism of the joint changes as we get older, um, and as the degeneration occurs. So, if the normal metabolism of the joint is to make good joint fluid and to make good proteins in the joint, and to make uh, anti-inflammatory uh, proteins that, that circulate in the joint. Believe it or not, the body does that. Uh, when you start developing an injury or arthritis, the metabolism changes inside of the joint and actually is like an acid that corrodes away the joint. All right, so we know that now. And by doing some of the treatments that we're going to talk about, you can actually uh, turn back the clock inside the joint and teach the joint how to um, make the uh, anti-inflammatory products and the normal proteins again. Now you've got your average uh, uh, treatments that everybody knows about. You've got your anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, you've got exercise, cortisone injection, and joint replacement. Uh, you probably heard as of late uh, the anti-inflammatories have gotten uh, a bad reputation uh, uh, due to cardiac effects and blood pressure effects and increased risk of, uh, of, of heart attacks and things. So if you are taking anti-inflammatories, uh, you have to be careful about two things. One. Uh, your stomach, and everyone knows that. If you're going to be on it for long term, you have to make sure you're on something to protect your stomach. But we're also learning now that if you have a problem with your heart, you better talk to your cardiologist because it can change the prostaglandins, which is a fancy name uh, for the different um, uh, inflammatory uh, hormones inside the body, and uh, it can affect the, uh, the heart. This is just a fancy picture that my marketing person put in there for uh, surgery. Okay, so there are lots of medications to relieve pain and control the disease. We talked about anti-inflammatory medications and how they can have life-threatening problems and side effects. And one of the mainstays of treatment is uh, physical therapy uh, for people that, that have joint pain as well as medications. And uh, it's important to exercise. Uh, aqua therapy, water exercise is also very good because it takes away gravity. Uh, but doing a, a general uh, exercise program organized by one of your trainers or a physical therapist is good because you want to maintain your strength and agility and range of motion. And it's most effective in the early stage of arthritis before you start developing all the inflammatory markers and all the pitting and stuff inside of the cartilage. Now, uh, cortisone injections is one of the treatments that they've been using for many, many years. Uh, and it can provide temporary relief. And if you have a little arthritis or a little bursitis, it's, it's okay to do it once, it's okay to do it twice. But drilling that, that joint um, with, with an injection of cortisone once a month or, or once every other month in the long run, it's not healthy to the joint, and it actually can wear away the joint a lot faster. And we talked about uh, uh, how it's not good for you. Not only is it good for the joint, but it can cause thinning of the skin. It can cause you to bruise easily, weight, uh, gain weight. Uh, it can cause swelling uh, in, the, in the extremities or puffiness. And it can cause thinning of the bones and things like that. So, um, and one of the, the, the bad side effects of, of cortisone is it can actually cause the bone to lose its circulation and you develop a condition called avascular necrosis. Um, 
Another a type of injection that they've been using probably for the past 20 years is a jelly injection, we call it. All right, it's viscose supplementation is a fancier name. And there are many different brands that I'm sure you see in all your magazines and, and on the television. We don't have to even advertise anymore. The patients come to us and tell us what they need. Um, but at Fluexa and Synvisc, and you know, you got that, you know, the, the couple in their in their seventies, they're running, you know, by by the lake or something because they had their their Synvisc injections. But uh, basically, what that does is Synvisc or any of those um, jelly injections, they're they're loaded with protein, and it's the same protein that's inside of the cartilage. So they they figured if they put that in there, maybe it'll do something. And they didn't really know, know how it worked initially, but now they, they know that it does create some kind of anti-inflammatory effect, and it's healthier than cortisone, and, and, it, and it can help. Uh, it doesn't reverse uh, the cartilage damage uh, that, that's occurring, but it can provide relief for up to six months at a time. And up until the new treatments that we're going to talk about in a, a little bit, uh, that has been the, uh, uh, the standard of care. Okay, joint replacement, arthritis pain. I think the picture uh, you know, says it all. And what we're going to talk about now is some of the bioregenerative techniques. It's a fancy name for uh, ways to manipulate the body into repairing itself. Now, do you agree that the body can, re can fix itself, you know, if it gets injured? Yeah. Right? A lot of people don't understand that concept, but it does it every day. If you cut your skin, it, it, it seals itself up in, in a week or two weeks, and you don't even see the, the scar anymore. If you break a bone, they put you in a cast, and you know if you have good healing, you're going to get better in six weeks to uh, to twelve weeks. If you have surgery and they um, you know cut things open and they put some stitches in there, and the stitches dissolve in a few months or less, but miraculously the body seals itself up and heals itself up. And what we found out was the common denominator of all the stuff is the blood. What's in our blood has the capacity to do the healing. When you cut your skin, you bleed, then you get a scab. And by the way, the scab is made of platelets. The platelets come to the area that's in the blood, and um, they, they form a clot, and the clot you know, coalesces and turns into a hard scab. And inside of that clot were the platelets where they break open. And inside of the platelets are all the growth factors. Lo and behold, there's hundreds of little growth factors inside of those platelets that tells the body what to do. Uh, they're the same growth factors that the body uses as an embryo to make a you know, baby, you know, from an embryo to a baby, all right? Uh, we have them circulating in our body and whenever we uh, injure ourselves, those growth factors are there to help save us. So what we found out is if we can manipulate those growth factors in the body, we can turn the body on and off and tell it when it needs to heal and when it doesn't need to heal. There's a treatment that uh, is not necessarily in this lecture, but I've been doing it for uh, close to 20 years. And this uh, technique has been around, uh, actually around 70 years. And C. Everett Coop uh, uh, actually used to send me patients when he was in Philadelphia. And uh, he himself was treated with this, uh, this treatment. I didn't personally treat him, but he himself had this treatment. It's a treatment called prolotherapy. And uh, many of you probably never heard of it, but I've been doing it a long time and helping a lot of people with it. And uh, people didn't really know how it worked. They just knew that it worked. And what we know now is that if you can uh, turn a signal on, uh, inside of the body in the area that needs to get fixed. If you can have, put it like light a signal flare at that area and get the platelets and stem cells to get down to that area, then the body will go ahead and, and fix that area. So with prolotherapy what we do is we inject uh, medications that are stimulating to the tissue that cause it to get inflamed and red. And the redness of course is blood rushing to the area and uh, inside of the blood are the platelets, and then the platelets would repair the tissue. And we didn't realize until the last 10 years or so how that process worked. And now, um, we also use prolotherapy for many areas, but we have advanced ourselves. And back in 2002, I took a trip to, um, to Europe, and I found that they were injecting uh, blood 
into people to make them look better. And I was asking some of the Eastern Europeans and the, and the French and people that were doing this, you know, what's this all about? And then they, t they explained it to me and I said, wow, the light went off my head. That's what prolotherapy is. They're actually, instead of tra trapping the blood to the air, they're actually taking the blood and, and putting it there and getting healing. But it's not just the blood itself. You have to concentrate the blood and take the platelets out of the blood, which is what PRP is. That's platelet-rich plasma. The R, the R in PRP stands for rich. Okay? So basically, um, what we do is we'll take, and we're going to talk about the, the, uh, the process in a minute, but we'll take uh, you know, blood uh, from the arm and we'll concentrate it down and then we'll inject it uh, where there are, are problems. We're going to talk about arthritis. Um, another technique that, that, that we're using are stem cells. And uh, that's, the, that's what I call like stage three. So prolotherapy was stage one, the platelets were stage two, and now we're also getting into stem cell treatments where we harvest stem cells either from the bone marrow or you can get stem cells from, uh, from fat like around the abdomen. And you know, most of us have a lot of that just you know, hanging around. So. Uh, and believe it or not, there's, there's, there's stem cells in the fat. And uh, through a process of extracting some of the fat and uh, centrifuging it, you can get a whole bunch of stem cells, like millions and millions of stem cells that you can use for various treatments. So that's, that would, you know, that's like stage three, and we're hoping for stage four someday where we'll have some other uh, uh, factors to even stimulate the stem cells. So getting back to platelets again. Uh, inside the platelets, uh, there are little granule, granules, and as soon as the platelets hits the tissue that's injured, the uh, granules break open, and inside the granules are um, many different growth factors. I can rattle off you know, eight or ten of them, but uh, that wouldn't mean anything to you. But there are growth factors that cause the fibroblast to, uh, to sti get stimulated. They attract stem cells. They, they, they attract protein to the area and promote healing. And they can be used for growing uh, muscle, ligaments, tendon, and bone, and cartilage. Now the fourth phase of healing You've got the bleeding phase, where the platelets come to the area. You've got the inflammatory phase, where the area is red for a while. You've got the proliferative phase, where tissue regeneration occurs, and that can occur over, over six weeks to a year. And then you've got the remodeling phase, uh, where uh, you've already got growth, but now the, the area um, remodels itself, so it gets smaller and tighter and looking more normal again. Some of the research behind this uh, uh, was done, this is just starting in 2006, uh, Dr. Alan Mishra uh, did some work over in Menlo Park, California, and he took cultures of fibroblasts, uh, which are your cells for making, um, uh, uh, I guess, ligament and muscle, and he treated them with these platelets, and, and he compared it to a group that didn't get the platelet treatment. And he found that the non-treated group had 87,000 fibroblasts in culture, uh, whereas the, the, the group that was treated with the platelets had a 3.28 fold or almost 300,000 platelets uh, in that Petri dish after seven days of culture. Okay, so it, it obviously uh, worked to increase the fibroblast, which is the new tissue. Uh, in another research article, it was in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, they took six rats and they cut the um, muscles and tendons down near the ankle. And they made it pretty deep, 75% wide and 60% deep. And then they injected growth factors on day one, three, and five. And the control group only got basically water. And they found that the muscles injected with the growth factor showed numerous regenerating um, muscle in, in the uh, both superficial and deep layers, and the control group response was much less, and uh, there was only some new fibers in the deep area. And at one month, the growth factor treated wounds were healed throughout, and the control group only showed incomplete healing with scar tissue. Um, Tiger Woods, uh, you know, other 
you know, famous athletes have had these treatments. They've gone to Germany for it and other places. Uh, and and I, I would say right now there probably is not a professional sports team or college team uh, that's not, you know, having their athletes treated with these types of treatments at this point. Uh, I've been doing it since 2002. I was probably the first person in the country to use it for arthritis and uh, one of the two or three people to use it for any, you know, anything in, in this country. But I, I didn't invent it. I was lucky enough to make that trip out to, uh, to Europe and kind of learn about it at the right time. Um, so in another uh, study, they took New uh, Zealand rabbits and they uh, took the cartilage in the knee and they made a gash in the cartilage. And then they uh, took platelets and in one knee, uh, they, they put PRP and then they had them resume activity for six weeks. Then they sacrificed um, the, uh, the, the, the rabbits and then they looked at what happened uh, five weeks, 18 weeks later. And all the treated knees showed cartilage repair in the defect at six weeks. At 18 weeks, there was greater cartilage thickness seen in the treated knees with PRP as opposed to the ones that weren't treated. And there was uh, no repair of cartilage seen in the non-treated knee. The conclusion was PRP promotes proliferation of resting zone chondrocytes, which is cartilage, and can repair defects and may play a role in, in uh, in what they call scaffolding chondrocytes, which is kind of like um, a screen that the chondrocytes can attach themselves onto and grow inside the knee. So how do we do this in the office? All right, um, A person would come in and it would take about 15 minutes. We would uh, draw their blood and uh, out of that blood we'd take it and we put it in a special centrifuge and a filtering process and after about 15 minutes, if we took, let's say, oh, maybe um, like three shot glasses or four shot glasses of blood or something like that, we would, we would get maybe about, um, about uh, maybe four or five tablespoons of the platelets. And that's what we would use for the treatment. And this is what our setup looks like. You have a little centrifuge and the laboratory kit. Uh, we have to purchase these kits from, from Harvest Technology. And uh, it comes with everything we need to, you know, to do the processing. That got me dizzy. Okay. And draw the blood. And then we put it into a special separator cup. And so what can you use this PRP for? Um, again, anything you can inject with cortisone, all right? Or you can use PRP, all right? The difference is cortisone gives you temporary reduction of inflammation and pain, but the inflammation, sometimes inflammation is good because that's what repairs tissue. When you cut your skin and it gets all red and inflamed, if you took cortisone into it and just washed all that good stuff out right after you cut your skin, you'd never heal that wound, all right? So you need some inflammation. So. With, with this uh, PRP, uh, you can pretty much work on any of these things and, and many things more. Uh, torn uh, shoulder, t rotator cuff tears, uh, tears in, in the capsule around the shoulder, people that have uh, tennis or golfer's elbow, uh, you can use it for tendonitis uh, anywhere in the body from the wrist to the ankle uh, or a hip or around the knee. Uh, you can use it on plantar fasciitis, which is that pain you get down on the bottom of your foot when you're walking. Uh, and it's used for basically arthritis anywhere on the body. We use it for, uh, I, pretty much when people ask where you can use it, I say you can use it from the your head down to your toes. So you can use it for the temporomandibular joint, the shoulder joint, elbow, wrist, fingers, uh, hips, knees, toes, you know, anywhere you got a joint. Uh, you, you can, you have a question, yeah. Is this considered a conventional treatment that's reimbursed by all insurance? This is a new treatment. This is, this has come onto the scene, I would say. Uh, it's been, I've been doing it for 10 years, but now it's really coming alive over the last three or four years. And we're not going to see the insurance companies and Medicare cover this probably for a little while longer before they decide, you know, that for whatever reason or whatever criteria they have that they're going to accept it. Um, mean, meanwhile, people are coming and going and, and getting, getting better. So for me, it's very exciting.
to be able to offer this. When someone comes to my office, I tell them there's these options and there's these options, and then it's up to them to decide. I don't, I don't like, like a salesman telling them what to do. So uh, we can use it for arthritis and tears and cartilage ins inside the knee almost anywhere. Couple case studies. Um, I had a 63 year old um, uh, gentleman with arthritis in both knees. He wasn't improved with the Advil and Aleve. He got the usual cortisone injections and physical therapy. Uh, the orthopedist told him he needed a knee replacement. Uh, he could not walk any significant distance and had trouble getting up from a chair. After six months of the PRP treatments, he had no pain, was walking long distances, and going up and down stairs without difficulty. Um, I would say, generally speaking, the success rate, if you have mild to moderate arthritis, the success rate of this treatment is 90% is, is or more. If you have moderate to severe arthritis, the success rate is closer to you know, 80% um, to 75%. If you have severe bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, believe it or not, you can still have success, but probably about 70 to 75% success rate. And the reason is because this treatment not only works to repair cartilage, but it also works as a very, very potent anti-inflammatory. Um, I may have been the first person in the country to report this at the American Association of Orthopedic Medicine about, about six years ago when I lectured there. Uh, but I was telling my colleagues, and I was showing them a joint that was, you couldn't even see it. I mean, there was bone on bone. You couldn't even see that there was a joint there. And I, and I, I posed them the question. I said, how did this repair the cartilage and take this person's pain away? And I proposed that the re I'll bring it down too loud. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, so I proposed that question to them, and I explained it to them. I said, there's got to be a potent anti-inflammatory effect. And then some articles came out a couple years later, and what I talked about before uh, was that uh, the joint itself, uh, the inner layer of cartilage, the, the, the layer of, of the joint that makes the fluid inside of the joint. Um, as we get older uh, and arthritis develops, it loses, the, 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 it loses its way, so to speak. And by injecting this PRP into it and the growth factors, it changes the cartilage makeup again and it, it takes that manufacturing plant and it starts making anti-inflammatory uh, um, uh, solutions for the joint and, and good healthy um, hyaluronic acid for the joint again okay and that's why I think it works with uh, even people with rheumatoid arthritis as well as osteoarthritis and people that don't even have a joint uh, you know there so once we get the PRP um, this this is uh, my procedure room in the office and um, you know, we have an x-ray uh, unit there and uh, a monitor in the background over here. So this is the inside of the joint, okay? That's the inside of this person's knee. And, you know, we'll do a sterile technique and, and then we numb it up really good so it doesn't, doesn't hurt when you put the uh, you know, injection in, unlike some people that just go in there and jab it in there. Uh, had a lot of experience. And, uh, you know, we have ways of doing it so it doesn't hurt. And uh, there's actually a little needle here. You, you can't see it in the picture, but that's a little needle and inside of the joint. And then we inject the uh, PRP, okay? So we look for the areas that are, are most damaged, and that's where we're going to concentrate the, uh, the platelets. All right, we have another person, 50 years old, right hip pain, a level seven, 7 out of 10, where 10 is the most severe pain, and 7 is is, uh, you know, on that scale, it's pretty bad. Uh, he could not put on his socks, he couldn't cross his legs, he couldn't do any sports or do any running. This, this, this guy's only 50. Um, he had chiropractic therapy, and he went to two orthopedic surgeons who told him he needed a hip replacement at the age of 50. Um, we gave him treatment with a PRP for five sessions and once a month, and after the fifth injection, his pain was almost gone, and he was back to playing sports and basketball, 
and he comes for a booster treatment every six months. Actually, I haven't seen this gentleman for a while, so I think he's still doing very well somewhere. Um, tennis elbow is, is another thing. Um, any kind of tendonitis or, ten, you know, or, or muscle pain you can use it. This was a 35-year-old female mu uh, musician who had tendonitis uh, at her elbow and had cortisone injections. Her pain was, was the worst possible for her. And we treated her with the PRP injections, and after three treatments, she was 80% improved. And by the fifth treatment, she was 90% improved. And we got her pain score down to 2 out of 10, and she was playing guitar. Something's supposed to be better. tendonitis, that's, that's the uh, tendon uh, below the knee. Uh, so when you go like this, it hurts, or if it goes up, you go upstairs, it hurts. Here's another patient that we treated with a PRP who had a 20-year history of tendonitis in that area, and nothing else helped her and um, or helped him. And after uh, three treatments, they were 80% better, and six treatments, 95% uh, better. Back to full activity. Uh, I just treated a, um, a cyclist who had uh, knee pain, and uh, he had actually bilateral knee pain, and he was in pain when, when he was, he was a long distance cyclist, and uh, he would be able to go, he said, about 1,400 miles a year, and now he tells me he's, he's doing like 3,800 miles a year, you know, with, with the treatments that, that you know, we gave him, so. Uh, and here is just, just me in my uh, little, uh, a little outfit, my Batman outfit here, uh, giving a treatment. Uh, that's trying to be cool or anything like that. It's just, uh, <laughs> just so I don't get x-rays in my face. Uh, we also use ultrasound, not just uh, x-ray. So that with ultrasound, you can actually look inside the body. Uh, x-rays looks at bones, and the ultrasound can look at all the soft tissues, which is kind of neat. And that's an ultrasound picture of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. And here's another patient who had a, had a painful toe. Um, we treated him with um, two or three sessions. Painful toe is like a bunion of the toe. And uh, it took only two or three sessions and we got rid of the pain in the toe. And then uh, he asked us to treat his wrist and he had some arthritis in the wrist. And with a few more treatments of that, we, we got rid of the pain in the wrist and in the toe. Now, in any of these treatments that we do, we're, we're getting rid of the pain, um, sometimes, uh, it works, as I said, by resurfacing the cartilage, and other times it works because it's a potent anti-inflammatory. So uh, some of these treatments may need to be repeated uh, once a year, for example. If we go through a course of treatment and, and someone is successful enough to get rid of their pain um, in five, six, or seven treatments, they never have to have that repeated again. If they come in in six months or once a year, you know, then, then usually that's enough to last them for another year, for example, okay? Because the effect is still, is still working. Uh, this is just a picture of how we injected this towel. And this is Walter, who had arthritis in his knee. He had surgery on his knee at a younger age. They took out all his cartilage in his knees, so and now he's walking on what's left, some thin layer of cartilage on, on, on his bone there. And uh, he couldn't walk very far. Um, he had level of pain six to seven out of 10. We gave him treatment once a month for seven months and we brought his pain down to a zero to one. And he said he was able to do all his activities he likes to do. And he has less pain in the um, knee we worked on than the one that had the knee replacement. But uh, that's because he had some tendonitis on the other side, but that's what he told me. Uh, he, he comes in now still once a year for a treatment. And, he, and he's pretty happy with his knees. And there's just the treatment of, of Walter's knee, where we gave him an injection where the arthritis was. Okay, so Walter also liked, liked to do some hunting, all right? Me, I'm not much of a hunter. I don't believe in hunting, but Walter was a hunter, and um, he, he had a problem with his, with his third finger, I guess. That was an important finger for him to do for his hunting. So he says, well, you know, you help me with your knee, can you help me uh, with my finger? And I said, okay, we'll give it a try. And, and we gave him um, 
a few treatments for his fingers, and and you know, he told you know, he did very well with that. And here we're treating a finger. Josephine, this this is probably um, one of my most difficult uh, patients in terms of arthritis that, that I've ever had. And I tried cortisone with her, okay? I tried physical therapy, we tried acupuncture, and uh, we tried even some physical supplementation things, you know, we talked about. And, and I said, well, let me, let me try the PRP. Uh, because she had bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, and I thought, well, it's, it's not gonna work. This was one of my earlier cases. And I said, well, let's try the PRP. And this is the one that I brought to uh, uh, the National Convention to show them how this lady, who has basically no shoulder, uh, got, got better with her arthritis. And, and even still today, she's still doing well. And I haven't seen her for about, about three years for her shoulder. And uh, this was her shoulder. This is the shoulder joint over here. And basically you can't see one, okay? But what you can see is, is I was able to sneak a little needle into that little crevice over there, that little dark spot, and we gave her the PRP over there. So Lillian had arthritis of her sacroiliac joint. She had back surgery before. Uh, we tried cortisone with her. I tried that prolotherapy technique I told you about before where you stimulate the cells to attract the blood to the area, and that didn't work with her. So I said, well, let's try the PRP. Now, I, I, I don't think I'm, I was curing her or SI joint at that point with the PRP, but I think we work, it works as the anti-inflammatory effect on her. And she comes in every four to six months for treatment, and I've been treating her now for about three years or more with this, and she's, this, you know, she's doing okay. And that's a treatment of an injection to the sacroiliac joint. Um, we're almost done with the case studies, and I'm going to leave some time open for questions. And I'll be happy to answer questions about anything that you have. Um, this, this was a 39-year-old female. Uh, used to be a cheerleader. She did the yoga. Uh, she, she did sports, and she has two children. Um, and, and she developed this, this terrible pain in the pubic area. And uh, even the x-ray showed that there was uh, sclerosis in the area, which is a fancy term for, for arthritis and, and bone irritation, and, and uh, the bone is just not happy. And uh, we tried cortisone just to make sure that that was where the pain was coming from because I wanted to do it as a diagnostic tool uh, that it was coming from that joint and not coming from some other source. She had two weeks release, so I said, okay, let's try the PRP. And, and you know, naturally she did pretty well. And this, this is the pubic bone over here. Okay, and it's, you can see it's misshapen. Um, it's not even, it's not symmetrical. This is the, the pubic bone uh, over here, right there where, you know, right below the uh, belly button. And she had some treatments and she, she did very well. Cynthia, uh, was in a car accident, she dislocated her wrist and thumb, and uh, I feel very good about this because she couldn't use her hand. Uh, she couldn't grasp anything or use her hand. So uh, uh, rather than go for surgery, uh, we treated her with the uh, platelet-rich plasma and, and prolotherapy. We got her uh, wrist taken care of and the thumb taken care of um, in about six or eight treatments. So. She comes in about once a year now for a treatment for her, uh, just one joint in her thumb, as opposed to about uh, seven or eight joints that we had to treat originally. And this is just how we treat her thumb joint. Conclusion. So, what's the story here? Uh, platelet-rich plasma, uh, the platelets, it actually has over 200 different growth factors, but there's seven big growth factors that stimulate cartilage growth, stem cell attraction, uh, fibroblasts uh, and, and uh, uh, attracting proteins for healing. And it can be used as a natural and inexpensive way of treating soft tissue, cartilage, joint pathology, uh, muscle and tendon pathology. Uh, this, by the way, is being used in dentistry. Uh, they're using it, they started using it in, um, in cardiac patients and uh, 
and uh, healing other areas of the body. Uh, the, the next stage of uh, PRP, uh, we talked about stage three with stem cells, and you probably hear about in your magazines or, or, or on the internet about how stem cells are being helpful for regenerating heart muscles after heart attack, and, and people that have liver problems are regenerating liver, and there's hope for the future with spinal cord injury and Parkinson's and things like that. This is real, this is real stuff, real medicine, real cutting edge. And you know, I'm very happy to be part of this. It's a very exciting you know, time uh, to be practicing medicine. Um, obviously, I wish it was uh, you know, paid for you know, by the insurance companies at a rate that, that we could you know, deal with it. Um, and, and hopefully, in, in the future, it will be. Uh, but uh, uh, the science is there, uh, the research is continuing, and, uh, and, and, and the sky is the limit because. Uh, in the future, we'll be able to regenerate organs um, as well as, as heal diseases uh, with the use of this type of technology. So thank you very much for that. This is some of my patients. You can go on the website and they talk about how the PRP and everything helped them. And that's my pussy cat. <laughs> Little ras we call him raspberry because he's red. He's really very cute. Yeah. All right. Um, Were you entertaining questions? I'd love to ask some questions. And, and you can ask questions about this. You can ask questions, personal questions if you want to. If you want to grab me later on and ask a question, you can if it's really personal. Um, you can uh, ask about anything in you know, interventional pain management, my specialty. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, so. Any, uh, any hands? What the front? Yeah, this, the PRP and things like that. Uh, Could you um, the question? Yes, the young lady in the front asked about ex, uh, uh, occip, occip, occipital neuralgia, yeah. Um, okay. Some causes of occipital neuralgia are actually well, let me tell you what it is first. It, it's, a, it's a headachy pain that you get from the back of the scalp. So the nerves in the back of the scalp become irritated and they cause chronic headaches. All right? Now, there's different kinds of occipital neuralgia. There's, there's some kinds that are caused uh, by like whiplash injury, accidents, arthritis that can cause irritation of the nerves and they're much easier to treat. And I would call that the secondary cause of it. And then there are, there are others where, for some reason, the nerve is injured and the nerve is damaged. And that is actually the rarest of forms. Uh, the most common form is because uh, you've had neck pain, pain for um, uh, you know, many years and uh, it causes headaches. And uh, you go to the doctor and they touch the little, little nerves up on the top of the scalp and they're tender, so he diagnoses you as a occipital neuralgia. But the real problem is that the muscles, tendons, and ligaments holding the neck together have gotten weakened over time. And when we inject those actually with the prolotherapy, um, I'd say 70% of the time, uh, we can eliminate the pain from the occipital neuralgia with that treatment. And if that doesn't work, then there's nerve blocks, and there's some other uh, new treatments that, that uh, I learned this past year that could be helpful with uh, occipital neuralgia for and actually any kind of nerve pain. If you can find the nerve in the area, uh, you can treat it with a different kind of neural therapy. But I hope that answers your question. And of course, medication. I hate I hate just throwing medicine and stuff. But you know, fortunately, we do have that. So uh, when the interventional things don't work, then we do have medications for nerve pain. And and in the real resistant cases, just as long as we're talking about that. Uh, you can actually uh, have a stimulator put in uh, where an uh, interventional pain specialist or a neurosurgeon uh, will, will get like a spinal stimulator implant and that will block the pain in the really bad cases. Any other questions? Can I ask you one of Yes, sir. What, what is the pain that we receive? Uh, I have a problem. It's not a serious one. So I'm told it's a sciatic nerve and it's painful. The doctor goes in and gives me a shot. Now, is there a chemical reaction between the shot and the nerve system? And many of the things that 
that you had. I happen to have a chemical background, so it's a question to, to ask. Uh, I never fully understood that. I've asked others, and I get a wishy-washy um, response. So and I said, what the hell? It cured me. I, part of my language. You see, it felt better for me. But, but I'm sure I've never been able to understand I got it. I'm gonna, what you guys, what you people have to do to give us relief. Is it a heat interaction? Is it a chemical reaction? Or is it just a... I think it's mostly a chemical reaction. There's, there's diff she, he asked about sciatica, all right? And there's different kinds of sciatica. Uh, the sciatic nerve uh, goes all the way down to the toes, but it starts up in the spine. So anywhere along the course of that nerve, from the cheek of your buttock down behind the knee, anywhere in the foot and ankle, you can have that nerve pinched. So the first thing a doctor needs to do is find out where the problem is so he can treat it the right place. And let's assume for a minute his is coming from his back, okay, because that's just, uh, you know, the usual reason uh, that people have sciatica. And it's usually related to um, a narrowing where the space that the nerve comes out of uh, or something called spinal stenosis, all right, where you have a central um, um, compression of the nerve near the spinal cord. And uh, that compression does two things. It causes a mechanical problem, all right, uh, and it can also uh, cause an inflammatory problem. Uh, so the inflammatory things we talked about in arthritis that's in your knee uh, can also act like battery acid uh, around the nerve in your back. And there's two things that are working when we give an injection for sciatica. One is you're using an anesthetic, which numbs things up. And the other thing we put in there is cortisone, typically, which is an anti-inflammatory. Now, the anesthetic, if you go to the dentist, uh, you, you know, you get your shot, and it's good for three or four hours, and then, oh, you know, the numbness wears off. But for some reason, and this helps you a little bit. The anesthetic uh, does something in resetting the gate, resetting the, the sodium channels inside of the uh, nerve. Uh, so it can take away the pain or inhibit the nerve pulse firing uh, for a much longer period of time in terms of weeks uh, or months after an injection, just from the anesthetic alone. Okay. Well, I was always curious about if you get a bad back pain, yeah. like I have a habit, of, and I sit and go in the water, it's very, very hot. I just got relief just by a thermal effect. Yeah, I'll talk about that, that too. Surprises me. Talk about that too. So the other thing that we have in, in the injection is cortisone. So the cortisone uh, we talked about the battery acid uh, effect will 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 decrease the inflammation um, uh, of those things that are that are that are circulating around the nerve due to the inflammation in addition to the compression. So that's how those things work, let's say, in an epidural injection. Now he asked about, well, why does heat make us feel better? So it's not just the heat of the pool or heat of the hot tub or heat of the shower, but, you know, the physical therapist uh, puts heat on you, um, you lie in a heating pad, but it's not just heat. Why does massage feel better, right? Why does electrical stim feel better? Why does all those other things feel better? And the nervous system is a very complex uh, thing. And uh, what we know now is that by creating uh, other stimuli in the body, uh, it affects the, the nerve uh, traveling up to the spinal cord and can block the sensations uh, from reaching the brain. So there's different things that we use from acupuncture to electric stimulation to heat uh, that has local effects uh, on the tissue for de decreasing pain, but also has central effects uh, in the spinal cord. Any uh, less scientific way? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Would it help somebody with feeling dizzy? Because I have dizzy spells. Say it again, B? Would it help someone who has PAD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
and even to the ar arteries directly in, in the legs. And you can you can grow new blood vessels in legs. And that's being done, uh, you know, around the world and in some places around the country. Um, and they're using it now also for heart. So uh, in some some uh, centers, maybe like Pittsburgh, you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland Clinic, uh, they're injecting the little um, arteries in the heart and getting the stem cells to go into and populate the heart muscle and they're reversing some of the muscle death that has occurred from heart attack victims. And they're also doing this in other areas of the world where they're a little ahead of us on this um, with, with uh, stroke victims and things like that. People have had brain infarcts as well. So the answer is yes, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> Question over here. Who, who was first? I think you were first. She was first. She was first, okay. What is sure. there? Oh, you saw that on my website? <laughs> up in there. Okay, she asked what mesotherapy is. Uh, mesotherapy is why I went to France in the first place, uh, to learn, learn about mesotherapy and not about PRP, but it was one of those fortuitous uh, things uh, when I was over there. And it's a technique that the French have been using. Uh, Dr. Pistor, P-I-S-T-O-R, actually invented it. And um, it's been around there for 30 years. Um, although in this country, we've only been using it now probably for about 11 years. Um, and what it, what it is, is is an injection of medications and substances. And so it's not used for any one thing. In France, they use it for uh, treatment of pain and arthritis and different things. And they also use it for making people look better. All right? So it, it's, it's right, exactly. So with, with mesotherapy, you're injecting medication under the skin um, in that little layer between the fat and the skin. And what they found out was anything you inject in that area is going to sit there a week. You know how some of the medicines you get nowadays come in a patch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a pill, all right? So it sits there in the skin. It, it, it gets absorbed over a period of a week or three days or whatever under the skin, and then it gets into the bloodstream. So by injecting any of these medicines, whether it's asthma medicine, whether it's pain medicine, whether it's something uh, you know, for making you look better, um, it'll, it'll sit in the skin and then it'll slowly absorb. So what do they use it for? They use it for um, getting rid of fat and cellulite, for example. All right, so uh, with this technique, you, you, can, you can put in actual drugs uh, and, and due to the receptors of the drugs, by manipulating the receptors, you can tell the body to dump the fat out of the, the fat cells. So you can get rid of fat, you can get rid of cellulite, you can make the skin look healthier again. And for treatment of pain, you can put in anti-inflammatories and anesthetics and get rid of pain with it. That, but that's it in a nutshell. Question over there. Um, bilateral peripheral neuropathy, a long standing of no known uh, region. Doesn't do anything in that respect. Yeah, these treatments uh, that I'm, I was doing here, as far as I know, we have not um, used it on peripheral neuropathy pain. Although, although I have hopes in the future that there will be treatments for that, and it probably will be related somehow to, uh, you know, to the PRP or stem cells or something or other. Um, but there's many different things that can attack the nerve. All right, from diabetes to renal problems. In your, you know, some, in your case, no one knows why. Uh, it could be nutritional or whatever have you. But uh, uh, many times we have to treat that with medications as, as one of the mainstays of treatment for that. Uh, the spinal cord stimulator we talked about before uh, can be used for severe cases of peripheral neuropathy if the medications isn't working. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough... Uh, it's a tough illness to treat when, it, when it's really bad. Uh, yes, sciatic uh, pain is very common among we of the advanced age. I'm talking about advanced age meaning over 55. You know, that's yeah. it. <laughs> okay. And uh, what I'm interested in knowing is whether or not uh, your PRP treatment has ever been used by you for something like a pinched nerve in the L5, S1 area, uh, rather than a selective nerve block that may be given there or, or, or one of the other nerve blocks. Have you ever done that? Are, are you a doctor, sir? Sort of. <laughs> 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 I, 
Richard, is your wife a doctor? I'm a uh, pediatric dentist. Okay. All right, so he has some knowledge there. Um, that's, that's a very, very, very good question. When, when I came upon this treatment back in the early 2000s, um, I said, wow, I wonder if this is going to work for, for nerve injuries as well. And, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're pioneering a new treatment, uh, you want to you do it carefully. And uh, I, I decided I didn't want to be the first person uh, to inject uh, you know, PRP in the spine. Uh, but the answer is yes, uh, it can be used for that. Of course, it's not something that's you know, covered by the insurances, uh, but uh, it is something that can be used for, for uh, nerve pain as well and, and, and in the spine. And some doctors are using that. I'm also injecting the discs in the spine with uh, PRP. So the question well. that I had was whether you have ever tried it for the spine. You say you have not used it. I, and I didn't want to be the first. You didn't want to be the first. Right. Okay. <laughs> but, but as of late, yes, I have. And uh, it also works for inside of the disc also to, to decrease pain in some cases. Yes. Yeah, because of its anti-inflammatory effect, I think it can help uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I would do it at one joint at a time to see if the person is responsive to it. As opposed to uh, you know doing it in, you know ten different places you know, where a person hurts, uh, just to be how should I say you know fair-minded you know because you, you never know whether someone's going to res respond to it or not with rheumatoid arthritis, and if they, and if they do then then um, you know then then I would go ahead and, and try it in, you know a number of different joints. Uh, I've treated probably about five or six people with rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Does someone ever respond? Uh, uh, negatively uh, with, with side effects? Um, okay, that's a very good question as well. Um, as I said before, there's the 10% NAC group and the 20% NAC group that it might not help. Uh, but the question is, does anyone respond negatively? Whenever you're using PRP or any of these treatments, it creates a little inflammation. Uh, which is like um, you're starting a little fire so that the inflammatory response, which is a normal response, can take hold. And uh, so you're going to hurt for later that day and definitely the next day. And, and then it starts decreasing by day two through day three or four. So you're going to hurt for a few days, but that's not really a negative effect. I guess I'm thinking of allergic. Yeah. Because it, this is, and I reported this at, at our National Society, I said this is the safest treatment out there. I mean, if I'm working near the brain or the spinal cord, you know, you're, you're injecting your own blood, right, without the clotting factors in it, basically, so you're not going to cause a blood clot anywhere. The worst that can happen is it goes into some, back into someone's vein or artery or it or, or goes into an area. So the answer, the answer is no. I mean, you could get an infection if someone's not careful. That's always a possibility. You have more of a risk of the, the needle hitting something bad than of the actual PRP doing something bad. Questions? So what will it take for the insurance companies to approve something like this? What is the last? Yeah, I've, I've got over 100 articles or more uh, written about this stuff. So, so already the science is out there. Um, you know, I can't really tell you exactly what's holding up. I, I know it, to get a drug to market, uh, it takes 15 years. Uh, a new drug from a drug company. If every, if every, any people worked in the pharmaceutical industry, you know that. And I've been told that. Um, it just takes time. It's really what it comes down to. Uh, I think that the insurance companies are listening. And I'll tell you, every patient that I treat, I'm saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars. If I can get rid of uh, arthritis pain and prevent someone from going to the hospital, getting this $20,000 you know, apparatus, uh, $20,000 to the doctor, you know, and $50,000 in the hospital, you can save $100,000 for you know, a few thousand dollars worth of, of treatments. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that eventually they'll see the, the writing on the wall uh, that you know they can save money on this. I mean, I actually, you know, I've spoken to some people on, on, 
on the higher planes about this, and how they can save money on it. And, uh, and now all the athletes are using it, all right? And it's all over the news. Now that you've heard it once here, you're probably going to turn on the TV and you're going to say, hey, I heard about that. And, but it's been out there now for, for well over a year. They were talking about it, and it's in, in the newspapers and on the, on the talk shows and, and, uh, and whatever. So uh, I'm, ho I'm hopeful within a few years, but I don't know. Question? Yeah. Um, uh, what now, how much longer does it start from day one now for, for it to get approved now that you've been doing the research? Yeah. Or does that, all that count? Yeah, I, I would say it's really been the last uh, three, four years that the insurance companies uh, really have been, know what it's all about. Uh, I was doing it you know, under the radar, so to speak, in my office, um, and and not charging the insurance companies, you know, because it was it was a new technique in the United States, you know, for for all those other years. So I, I don't know how long it's going to take. We can go to France. <laughs> yeah, but uh, your insurance won't pay for it there either. <laughs> it might be cheaper. That's very true. I have a question from our dental expert now. By the way, dentistry used this before medicine for periodontal surgery and things like that. If you look at the research on PRP, you're going to find that the research in this country, they were using it even before 2002 when I started using it for orthopedics. And before dentistry, the veterinarians were using it before them. The, the, vets, the vets are at everybody. About how much is the treatment? Okay, it depends on, on the area we're treating. Uh, the kit costs anywhere between $250 to $350 for that little laboratory kit. And then I just charge my injection depending on, on where it is. Like one knee, for example, would be $400 for the injection, and the kit would be $250 uh, if we use the, you know, the medium kit. Um, if the two knees, it would, it would be $350 for the kit, but it gives you twice as much of the PRP. But instead of charging 800, we charge 600, you know, for the treatment. And it, again, it could take anywhere from four treatments for you to, to see it working. And then a maximum anywhere from five, six to seven treatments to, to be where you want to be for it to last for, you know, a year or longer. So that, if that gives you a, a range. And it takes about, it, it takes about 45 minutes, you know, to do the treatments. I would like to know if there is a difference in your results with younger or older people. Do you get better results with the younger generation? Generations? Uh, because usually the older people uh, take longer to heal or have more problems. So that's a, an interesting point. That's a very good question. Uh, of course. Uh, you know, the younger you are, the more platelets you have, the better healing capacity you have, uh, and, and the better better healing you're going to get, uh, the results you're going to get. Um, but the beautiful thing is, with the PRP, is when a person can't heal because they're older, the body has lost its ability to mount that strong inflammatory response uh, to, you know, to get the healing, uh, you can concentrate the platelets so that you can uh, you know get the effect you want to get where you wouldn't be able to get it without, without doing that. I mean they, they've done studies where they took a big gash into the muscle and then they, they put the PRP into the muscle and and uh, with the PRP it was able to heal uh, these big gashes in the muscle whereas without the PRP even a, even a young healthy person would never heal. So uh, I, 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 you know, I stand by my reputation in that uh, even even in the 70, 80 year old uh, plus uh, range, we're still getting you know results with it. And anybody that comes for a consultation will always tell them what their you know success possibility is based on age and based on how bad the joint is. And if a person is in that stage, for example. 
where maybe you're in your 70s or something, and um, and I think well maybe I can maintain this, you know, for seven, six, seven, eight years, but you know it's it's pretty bad, uh, and and even even after five, six, seven years, you might need a knee replacement, but then you're in your you're you're going to be well in your 80s. I might tell somebody if you don't mind getting a knee replacement, and if now is the right time in your life to do it, go ahead and do it. You know, if you want, if you want to get the replacement now, um, so it's not for everybody. You know, you have to look at the social factors, the financial factors, um, the the physiologic factors of each individual person, and and then and then we sit down with them and and then see what's best for them in terms of what they want to do. Thank you. Pain problems other than PRP. <laughs> you know, let's talk about. I'm here for questions afterwards if you want to talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.